Would anyone like to start? Yeah. The, uh, the vote on the logo, the new logo contest, is going to be open until a business meeting because apparently there's a tie at the moment. So if you haven't voted, do vote and put your thing in the box. So do we have any questions to start off? I don't need this. For that, we have, we have these brook trout inventories all over the place, uh, and it seems to me as though they're in smaller, maybe first, second order streams. Um, subsequent to that, what's being done, oh, let me preface that, with these perch culverts, if the culvert is functional, it's not going to be replaced if it's perch, it's not going to be replaced for animals needing to get upstream. There's no money to do it. Is there anything being done to accommodate that animal passage for those small culverts, small universal culverts? Could everybody hear me? Of course. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me, let me uh, start with the brook trout stuff first. The, uh, you're right. So most of the populations outside of a handful in New York and a handful in New Hampshire are in first and second order streams. They've been relegated to the headwaters where they survive. Um, in terms of some of those culverts you're not going to remove, as you mentioned, because you don't want the brook trout population to be open to competition. Right? That's what you're talking about? Partial. Partial. Okay. And the second part of your question was, is there anything to be done for the animals to access? No. Over no, time. no, the question is, like for driver animals, it's for anybody that needs to get upstream. No. And you're right about the culvert being a barrier, and that's a good fight. I mean, maybe we want to put perch culverts in there to keep <laughs> bad guys from getting upstream. But on the other hand, brook, I think brook trout home on cold water by smell, and I think they are na and I think they they spawn in natal reds and also get there. And if they drop down and it, it's hot in the summertime and they want to get to that cold water, and here's a perch thing. So you could put this in, and also if you had a, a device cheap that you could hook on there and use it seasonally, or if there's a flood coming. You could take it off, and you and I could put that thing on, throw it in the back of a pickup truck. There's a, what I'm saying is, I think there's a way, but I'm not seeing I'm not seeing this being done to accommodate this pro, this lack of connectivity on these perch culvert streams. Well, uh, I'll just say that that there's there's a you know a number of solutions out there besides replacing the whole culvert. You know, in terms of building up the tail of the pool below. Um, but yes, we need innovative solutions to deal with some of these culverts because uh, their, you know, their population sinks. You know, the fish go over and they can't get back up in the summer, and they're going to blink out. Thank you. Any other questions? Somebody got a question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so can anyone uh, give me an example um, where resiliency was successfully enhanced through uh, increasing species richness, uh, particularly where you know, we've lost a lot of species? I mean, I know there's the Lake Ontario efforts for the deep water corgonis, but I mean, are any other sort of examples that come to mind as far as increasing richness in an effort towards building resiliency?
okay. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Anybody out there? <laughs> We've got the experts here, so any questions? That's a good one to think about. What's that? The question. The question? Yeah, I just, you know, there, there isn't a quick answer, obviously. Okay. I mean, Chris's question. Well, uh, you know, across this, the, of all the talks we had here today, uh, obviously the, it, it is a complicated, you know, uh, issue to, to this idea of resiliency and building resiliency and, and incorporating adaptive management. And I think we did have some good examples presented here. Do, do you, do, do any individuals here, like, can you point to what you think are really good examples of, of making headway? <laughs> In, in building resiliency and incorporating, you know, a number of these concepts that have been talked about today, uh, in, into into those kind of management plans. I mean, Chuck mentioned the the Lake Ontario plan. Are there other plans, you know, that you're working on currently that are that, that you think are effective, you know, moving in this direction? So anyone that anyone that might have a comment on that. I think the last reauthorization of Magnus and Stevens certainly has a, a lot of aspects that enhance resiliency, particularly the rebuilding requirements. So it, it used to be before that reauthorization, um, rebuilding was something you can kind of kick down the road until it was convenient. And then the last reauthorization put in the 10-year uh, the rebuilding timeline. And that's been quite effective um, in terms of rebuilding populations. The, um, the economic and social impacts are another question uh, entirely. Um, but in, in terms of ensuring that um, populations rebound quickly when they've been depleted, having that 10-year timeline in there is certainly more effective. I think related to that, I would uh, I could throw into the uh, the recognition of uh, Pacific salmon populations as evolutionary significant units in ESA, and then. Uh, also, some of the theory coming out of Lake Bristol Bay for uh, portfolio effect of stocks and the importance of that is heightened uh, management's awareness of that. And that, if you have, and you know, good arguments made for having a diversity of both uh, productive salmon populations and lesser productive salmon populations as a portfolio effect to maintain, you know, long term resilience of Pacific salmon. That might be another. Down. What do you think, Don, about your your plan in Ontario? Our area is that what you're moving towards, like with, with the perch? Well, yes, we're we're using a walleye template that we're pretty happy with in developing our perch management plan. This um, stakeholder involvement uh, component is brand new to us. So far, we like it, <laughs> and uh, we'll. Maybe five years from now, I'll be able to speak to how well it really worked out. But we have every confidence that uh, we're in a good place right now. Any questions? And given the, uh, the current trend in uh, this country, at least, with regards to government involvement, with the arguments that we need less government, less interference, and, and, and uh, you know, let be more laissez-faire. Uh, how do you see going forward? I mean, we've talked about adaptive management, and obviously it, it looks like we need to get more stakeholders, actually people that are invested in, 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 your, in the issue, to get involved, because it looks like, at least at the federal level, and some states too, they're backing out. They're doing less, not more, in terms of environmental issues. I and mean, it all happens is, you know, the other day, uh, we heard an issue yesterday with Walkerton's water quality problem. We have one in New York now, Guzik Falls. I mean, we've had the GE issue on the Hudson, and uh, some of these, we, you know, restoration and reclamation costs are unbelievable, and yet it's almost like we're regressing in the whole system rather than going forward in terms of so the question really is, 
is, is the alternative or adaptive management approach, is that the way to go now with regards to resource protection and enhancement? You know, one of the trends we've seen at the Forest Service is there's been a real uh, growth in uh, embracing the concept of ecosystem services. You know, a lot of us traditionally as biologists are uncomfortable with monetizing the environment or the value of natural resources, but there's a big movement um, in, you know, providing some sort of value uh, to these services that you know, these watersheds provide or that these fisheries provide and, um, and it's becoming mainstream and uh, it's something that is been written into the planning rule of the Forest Service in 2012 that, you know, each forest has to look at ecosystem services. So, um, you know, I think there's a, a lot of uh, potential there because it basically trans, um, it, it, it uh, it allows the public to see values that have always, of course, have always been there, but haven't been expressed in the argument. So when you're doing the benefit-cost analysis, you can now say, you know, the value of this clean water is X, and everyone always holds up New York City as the global model, you know, for the unfiltered drinking water supply, and that's, um, and I think that's fair. So I think the the trend in, in looking at ecosystem services for a lot of these things that, that we have inherent value for um, is going to help in the public debate. Uh, Dan and I were talking last night, and I, I think one of the things as a profession, just fisheries, but also more broadly in natural resources in general, we've done an incredibly bad job ever talking about our success stories. It's always gloom and doom about how the environment's going down. So in terms of public policy, why should we have <coughs> regulation? Everything's, we always, all we ever say, it's going bad. Why shouldn't we start talking about the success stories like Don talked about in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement on Lake Erie? We should be highlighting those types of things, and the Clean Air Act and the effects on Adirondack fisheries. We started talking about that as how environmental policy has really made a huge difference in the last three decades. And then I think your public, too, would be more receptive to having some governmental involvement in those sorts of issues. And I, I think if we did a better job of connecting that way, rather than just telling them what, what's going wrong, it could be quite helpful. It gives them a sense that, indeed, we can make a difference. Well, I was going to say that um, it's like in my household with my kids, I'm, I'm the federal government, and my small two-year-old is the local community member, and if I tell them what to do, she's not going to listen to me. And so we see that a lot with um, out in the communities where we have flood mitigation strategies. And you know, if people just get told you have to do this, you have to do that, typically it doesn't happen, especially in a response to a flood, where the most common response is, let's go out and bulldoze a creek up, make a nice you know, trapper's or a channel. <coughs> We all know that has negative impacts on aquatics. So what, we're, what the emphasis now is to actually get the community involved, give them the knowledge at the get-go. So when there is the next flood, they actually have a, a, a toolbox of options to do. So they're not being told what not to do. They actually have the empowerment to make informed decisions of what to do in terms of flood response. So um, you know, in some instances, with less government is fine as long as the community members who actually live by the streams are making these decisions that severely impact uh, stream aquatics have the information to, to go about and making these management strategies, understanding that the creek will move around, understanding the creek will flood, uh, but if they can adapt to their uh, communities to those phenomenons and not go out and do the first uh, dredging or bulldozing exercise, it will have an impact on um, aquatics. I'll be more, this is a, a bigger concern of mine, but it addresses the same thing. It's after a couple of years of immersing myself in cable news channels to an extent that's probably not healthy. <laughs> I think we're in the middle of a battle that, that 
that will unroot a lot of this stuff, and, and that's the public's trust in, in scientists and what we say. When I was growing up, the news would say scientists say such and such, and you go, okay, they're scientists. But now you watch the news and they say, well, the CDC's lying about how dangerous Ebola is because Obama's telling them to. Or so-and-so's lying about climate change because they want the government to have more control. And, and I think a lot of the public are buying into that. Suddenly scientists are get, kind of getting labeled as having political objectives. Nobody trusts anymore that we're objective and neutral. And I think we're, <laughs> we're going to lose a lot of battles. Once, once we lose our credibility as being separated from the fray, and reporting what we see in an unbiased way without an agenda, and, and enough of the public buys that, that we're not capable of doing that, a lot of what we do is going to be really hard to make a difference with it. But, but that's going on. There's a big fight trying to say scientists have an agenda. Whoever it is that's funding their research or, or whatever their political beliefs are, they're going to skew their data in a way that represents it that way. And I think a lot more people out there believe that than those of us in, in our, our circle of scientists recognize. And that scares me. That, that we're going to have trouble managing our resources with good science because people aren't going to trust the science we report to because they're going to think we have some agenda. And I don't know how to fix that, but, but I'm starting to hear what should be scientific debates being portrayed as political debates, and, and I don't think it does any of us any good. I guess I was just going to add, too, in context to the stream, but a lake example, some of us are starting to look at sort of the role of lake associations and thinking about local management instead of a non-diverse one size fits all the state manages the lakes what's the contrast and what are the benefits of a local management if you turn certain portions of the control over to the community be it a lake association or a series of lake associations could you get a benefit for where someone's more mobile potentially less constrained less constrained by resources you know could they actually manage that resource in for the public good, for themselves, that good as well, and in the context of what the users specifically in that area were looking for. So it's just one of those ideas that some people are putting out there. Lake Association is just one example of sort of that regionalization or a different view of uh, resource management. Just a, a comment for me. I, I work for the National Marine Fisheries Service, or NOAA Fisheries, and we spent a lot of time on stakeholder engagement, and we have quite the diversity of, of stakeholders to deal with, and they often have very conflicting ideas about resource condition and allocation issues, et cetera. Um, the example that Don gave in his presentation was really about the application of, of management strategy evaluation, um, and that's something that the agency um, is very much putting an emphasis on now. So there is, um, basically individuals in each one of the six science centers or the five regional science centers that is focusing on management value or management strategy evaluation. Where we're going to apply it is to a, a very contentious fishery uh, or resource, uh, it's our Atlantic herring resource and it's, this is a primary forage species out there um, and everything from cod to whales eats it. Um, it's very important uh, source of bait for the lobster fishery, which I pointed out earlier, is one of the three most valuable fisheries in the United States. There is a large midwater pear trawling fishery for them that removes literally um, hundreds of, of thousands of metric tons annually. There is contention because some, uh, some fisheries feel that there's localized depletion and therefore, for instance, the bluefin tuna don't come in because the herring are gone. Um, the cod uh, aren't there anymore because there's no herring to feed on. And so, uh, you know, our, our strategy here, I guess, is to, to try and apply MSC to get those stakeholders in the room and basically try and hammer out, um, a, you know, a management system uh, that people are going to have buy-in for. So for us, I, I can't report on success or failure, but uh, it's going to be a great experiment. Morning, I think you were talking about how we've changed the cup, the 
the shape of the cup or the size of the cup, the dimensions of the cup. And if if that could be looked at in terms of how that fits in with cumulative impacts or cumulative effects and how it in turn influences resiliency, and how that might, focusing on uh, some of the things that we can readily change, uh, say in a watershed or landscape, uh, thinking more in terms of freshwater fisheries, how that might be compared to uh, the, the impacts of climate change, for example. And so taking a look, uh, a larger scale look rather than from the water out or into the into the lake or into the stream. Um, and I, and I, I was wondering if that could potentially tie in if it's, if it's related to larger land use issues, if ecological restoration isn't something to, to think about in terms of fisheries management in the future. When you say ecological restoration, what do you think, what are you meaning there? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not thinking necessarily in terms of restoration ecology. I think uh, that would be described as the science of ecological restoration. But I do think of ecological restoration in terms of getting, as many of you uh, have mentioned, getting stakeholders involved. And uh, I also think that includes getting uh, the public, public participation or citizen participation as an important part of that to maybe reconnect people with the landscapes and or their backyard in a more intimate way, um, in a way that goes beyond commodity, but maybe helps uh, cultivate an ecological conscience as well. That, actually, yeah, you perfectly described that 2012 paper that I put up by Wincy Biggs. Um, it's what everything you just described there is a component of those factors that you can do to build resilience because you likely can't do some of them. So those that you can do, you you know address. Um, that's a that paper's you know, very far-reaching. There's maybe one fish example in the entire thing, and that used to sort of turn me off from the paper. Now, those are the papers I like to read because you actually start to see the parallels instead of saying, oh, that's just different. You look for the patterns that are the same, whether you're in a terrestrial environment or you know some other place and some other resource. So. I think you're spot on with those things. Oh, coming back. I actually have a comment on that discussion. I would say that we shouldn't call it ecological restoration because the baseline is shifting and everything, the cup keeps moving forward. It's more like a corrugated hill that we're going along. So portraying it to people, especially stakeholders, saying we're going back to some previous state is probably a little disingenuous, especially with larger drivers like climate change, invasive species, things we don't have a lot of local immediate control over. So it's really more of a values-driven discussion. What are you trying to achieve? What are the values? You know, we say restoration because we have this ecological ideal in our head of what the fish community should be or what the plant community should be that is probably unachievable in many, in many cases. But like with the marine fisheries example, it's like, and, and even with the Lake Erie example, it's like we can hit this target and keep it here. Everybody might have to lose a little bit, but it's not what was here pre-Columbian. It's not necessarily maximum sustainable yield. But if everybody agrees that this is the box that we want to have and be in, then everybody needs to be involved in the definition of the box and agreeing to keep everybody in that box. And nobody's going to try and push their side of the box a little further because everyone will lose. But I think that calling it ecological restoration is probably a, a disservice to what we're trying to accomplish uh, currently. So, sorry. I'll just respond to that in, in the uh, realize that one of the challenges with the ball and cup diagram is that. Um, we only ever observe the ball. The, uh, the, the cup, we have to infer based on the dynamics of the ball and what we think the, the perturbations were. Um, so understanding whether the, the, um, the, the cup, whether the resilience has changed is probably one of the most challenging things that we, we can do empirically. We, we know from simulation studies that um, it's possible to shift the, uh, to shift the cup, and, and there's even been some experimental work on it. Um, but, but really that cup is so critical and, and so difficult to observe empirically that that's really one of the challenges. Yeah, I, I, just, I just want to, I, I think you make a really good point about the ecological restoration, but I think that 
uh, that has come a long ways in thinking that we're trying to work towards some stable state. And uh, ecological restoration has, has itself has been uh, divvied up in different, different categories. Complete restoration, which is very difficult. Functional restoration, or something as uh, straightforward as experiential restoration, where people get involved, and it's not going to be uh, what it originally was, which is probably an unstable state. Anyways, but just the idea, I think there's some concepts there that are still worthwhile looking at. Uh, the breadth of experts up there is, is impressive, and yet New York has such a diversity of water types. The Hudson and the warm water streams weren't really attended to. The Hudson downstream of Albany were, I guess throughout New York we've had the, the water quality improvements, and, and the systems have rebounded. If you'd say the Hudson, you were looking for what's gone right there, and, and, and the anadromous fish are so complicated we don't hear the voice from those experts very often, or the Susquehanna has, uh, here we are at the headwaters, and Pennsylvania has such a plaguing problem with the smallmouth, what happened to the resilience of, of the, that fish community? So just trying to take this to a scale where we aren't as well studied, our streams, our warm water streams, and uh, I don't know how anyone can plug into that, but we've got these other systems that we haven't done as much study, and where do we look for case studies in, in these other water types? Maybe there aren't any. It's just not as well studied. Doug, I, I don't think I can answer your question, but really the foundation for whatever we were able to do on Lake Erie was just having a wonderful data-rich environment. So we could, we could use the information we had to make reasonable predictions of, about the future expected outcomes of different fishing policies. So without that, <laughs> I don't know where we'd be, but that was that was integral to uh, implementing our management plan the way we, we did. I was gonna mention that there are um, some other efforts out there like the National Fish Habitat Partnerships uh, that span different geographies. Um, I don't know if there's one with the Hudson, but there is an Atlantic Coast Fish Habitat Partnership um, that would include at least the Hudson and the Susquehanna. And so, you know, a lot of these models that we've seen up here, if the data are there, they can be plugged in, um, whether it's a presence absence catchment model or, or something more complicated than that. So, um, I think that, that that's one place to start looking are these fish habitat partnerships um, and there's probably some other larger efforts out there too that we just don't necessarily know about right here. Well, I, I have an observation of what, what Doug was saying. We, in our little adaptive management group yesterday, we talked about it. So what's kind of driving what we're looking at here? It, it's largely, a lot of times it's, it's sport or commercial fish driven or it's mandated you know, listed species, and then, then what falls in between the cracks are, are a lot of these fish that you're talking about, Doug, and that, that Randy talked about. So, does anyone up there have any thoughts on, you know, incorporating these other, all these other fishes into these, into these management plans that, that One of, one of the experiments that we really have going on right now is on the Penobscot River in Maine. It's not a, not a warm water system, I apologize, but perhaps it sort of uh, will touch on some of the things that are important. For years and years, Atlantic salmon restoration in, in the United States has focused on three, primarily three large rivers, the Connecticut River, the Merrimack River, and the Penobscot River. And really sort of the last vestiges that we have of Atlantic salmon in this country are in the Penobscot River and seven listed rivers uh, in the downeast area to the north of the Penobscot. Um, there was an extraordinary uh, sort of societal uh, decision to take out some of the lower river dams on the Penobscot. And that opened up uh, a whole, you know, miles and miles and miles of river habitat to anadromous species that really were reaching there with any sort of regularity. There was fish passage on these lower river dams, but it was always focused on 
passing Atlantic salmon, and, and I'm not a fish passage expert, but I know that you know different species require different strategies. So by removing those dams, you've basically given access to things like blueback herring and alewife and, and American eel and sturgeon um, to, to move up those rivers. And, and one of the thoughts, even about the Penobscot Bay itself, which used to have a very healthy cod population, um, you know, thinking there was their primary prey base was, was these, you know, river herring that, that basically have been blocked from going up river. So uh, a bunch of, of organizations, both federal, state, and, and private, are, are collaborating on really assessing uh, the restoration of the in, entire anadromous fish community in the Penobscot. And the feeling is that if we get, you know, it's not going to be sort of that virginal state that, that the river was once in. But by managing it more as, as an entire ecosystem rather than you know really targeting it on individual species, the hope is that we'll end up with a healthier ecosystem over time. And just deal with the fisheries question. There was a, in one of the presentations, I can't remember which, it indicated clearly that the Alaska branch were really on uh, the verge of almost extinction. What would happen if, in fact, the entire Lasma Bank community got officially neutralized, so it was out of the marine system? What type of a perturbation would that have for the rest of the, of the uh, ecosystems in the ocean? So just, just to clarify and then to respond to your question, the, uh, the work on elasmobranchs I presented there was showing that elasmobranchs have the best indication of ali effects at relatively large population sizes of any of the groups that we looked at. Those ali effects are probably still only happening at, at down around 10% of uh, unfished abundance. So they still have to get down pretty low before there's any possibility of ali effects. Um, in, in terms of the ecological impacts of removing uh, sharks, there has been some fascinating work um, out of Dalhousie University looking at that, um, in particular looking at trade-offs between large sharks, um, rays, and bay scallops. Uh, and, and then more recently some work that Julia Baum, uh, University of Victoria, has done um, looking at fished and unfished areas in the Central Pacific and the, uh, the fished areas, the first thing that happens there is the, the large sharks are removed, basically. And, and uh, subsequent changes cascading down through the food webs there. So we, we do have some interesting examples of what happens there. And uh, it is a shift and a total rearrangement of a lot of the fish community below them. that might be a little bit too sim simplifying things down a little bit too much, but it could be a question you might get from a reporter, so I'll ask it. <laughs> I'm curious to know if there's a consensus across the panel um, as to the number one thing you would do to increase fisheries resilience across New York State, or whether there would be a plurality of views, given all of your different backgrounds. So